That's great. Well, thanks a lot, Bob. He, uh, I, I won't tell you how much I paid Bob for that <laughs> introduction. Uh, first of all, it's really nice to be here. I haven't been to Weedon Island before. I've known about Weedon Island from how well known the archaeological record is here for a long time, but it's just one of those places where, for whatever reason, never quite got here uh, until right now. And, and uh, even though it's dark outside, uh, the whole concept of combining cultural and natural history is, is one that's always been real close to my heart. And up at the Florida Museum of Natural History, we, we try to run our programs in a way where we don't care which kind of ology you really like. And in fact, a lot of what we do, you can get into a real dull or argument about whether it's paleontology or archeology span or, or, or whatever. So we have people doing research with students in pretty much any aspect of the natural and cultural uh, sciences. In fact, I would take it a step further and say that a lot of what we do, it's hard to pigeonhole whether it's cultural or natural or whatever. We're all part of one big, one big thing. And so tonight, I I'd like to talk to you a little bit about a couple uh, research projects that I've had going uh, in, in recent years. And and about the interface of, of biology and, and archaeology. And so a lot of this is going to involve uh, what you, we can learn from bones in, a pre, in prehistoric context. So uh, bones from archaeological sites and how those bones can be just as useful to biologists as they are, as they are to archaeologists. So a lot of this will involve the pretty well-known field of zooarchaeology. Zooarchaeology sort of got off the ground in many ways. Liz Wing, who's retired from our museum up there, was one of the real pioneers in zooarchaeology. And the, the main premise of that was that in a lot of archaeological sites, especially in places with sweet soil, with limestone soils like Florida uh, or a lot of tropical islands, in these prehistoric archaeological sites, you get great preservation of bone not just human bone, but bone, but non-human bone. And by studying that, you can get an idea of what these people were eating, of which species of, of anything that they were, uh, that they were uh, killing and bringing back to their camp, uh, whether it's vertebrates, which is my bias, studying bones, or invertebrates, studying mollusks and other hard-shelled organisms that can come back, uh, that, that can be brought back and typically deposited in middens in these what were call, oftentimes called kitchen middens, trash middens, people's garbage heaps. Uh, and, and, and then maybe starting about 20 years ago, it, start, it became more apparent that these, the bones in these middens, in these prehistoric archaeological sites, could also tell us a lot about how biodiversity has changed through time. So biologists started to get just as interested in this, uh, this source of information as archaeologists uh, w would. And the, one of the bottom lines is careful analysis, doing very careful species level identifications of these bones is going to yield high quality information, whether it's to the archaeologists who might be interested in what people ate and maybe how those food habits changed through time, or to biologists who are interested in, okay, a thousand years ago, what was the fauna like here? Or 500 years ago, or 5,000 years ago? And oftentimes these uh, cultural sites is the main window uh, into that. So tonight, uh, and it wasn't, wasn't on purpose that I cut us off from that map. This is just what the map was. So if we were one bay farther north, we, we could, you know, we could, there we'd be right there. But anyway, to give you some perspective here, I'm going to talk about two areas in the, in the Caribbean. One is the Bahamas, very close to Florida, but in spite of being very close to Florida, purely oceanic islands. No prior connections to the North American continent, even during maximum lowering of sea level 400 feet. Uh, in, the, in the Pleistocene during the Ice Ages, the Bahamas have always been oceanic islands. And then I'm also going to talk about Trinidad and Tobago, especially t Tobago, down here off the north coast of South America. Unlike the Bahamas, these are not oceanic islands. These are continental islands that during the uh, Pleistocene uh, glacial times were connected 
to mainland South America. As a result, they have a very, the flora and fauna on Trinidad and Tobago are very continental, and, and uh, whereas in the Bahamas, the flora and fauna are very oceanic, even though there's just this narrow straits of Florida in between, the way the Gulf, uh, the way the Gulf Stream rips through there going north, it, it, there's been a very clear separation of, of, of a lot of uh, biological entities. And then I guess you have a talk coming up with, with uh, Bob Carr, right, on prehistoric and maybe into historic time cultural connections between the Bahamas and Florida. And uh, I'd love to hear what, what, he has to say, what he has to say about that. So anyway, within the Caribbean, we're going to look at the Bahamas and Trinidad and Tobago. And then we're going to go out to the South Pacific for a little bit. And then we'll end with a site here in Florida that I've been excavating for uh, the last five or, five or six years. And I'll, I'll tell you about that uh, when, we, when we get to it. Now, the sequence is going to be a little illogical. We're going to start with Trinidad and Tobago. Then we're going to jump out into the Pacific Ocean, only a few thousand miles out this way. And then we're going to come back to the Bahamas and then uh, end up in, in North Florida. So it should be quite, quite a little tour here. Let's see if the, this, oh boy, look at that. Uh, so, so here's a close-up of Trinidad and Tobago. You can see here's the delta of the Orinoco River, very close to mainland South America, uh, currents going this way. And if even today, especially in the rainy season, if you see uh, uh, at the delta of the Orinoco here, you can see big rafts of vegetation and stuff getting just out a little bit into the Atlantic and then being swept right out by Trinidad and Tobago. Very easy to see how, even without a direct land connection, how these things are very close to a continental, uh, continental source area. And, and these mats of vegetation that can be, I mean, literally like 500 yards by 500 yards big. So they're, these are big, big sources uh, for plants and animals uh, to get out there. Culturally, in pre prehistoric times, in, in, the, the, uh, in the last several thousand years, there's a, uh, on both Trinidad and Tobago, the people, uh, the Amerindians that were there, are that record correlates pretty closely with the record in, in adjacent Venezuela and to islands in the Lesser Antilles to the, to the north. This is a, an archaeological site called Golden Grove uh, on Tobago, and it's just a modern cattle ranch, uh, cattle ranch today. Here are uh, four students from University of Florida. This is a survey we were doing at, at the Golden Grove site in 2000. Uh, for trying to doing test pits to try to figure out what the full extent of the of the site was. We now know the extent of the site pretty well. It's about 120 meters by about maybe 200 meters in, in the other uh, in the other direction. Here's good old Bob Austin. Uh, very, sorry, I scanned this quickly. It's a very grainy scan of Bob. As you know, he's much more handsome than this, but. Uh, uh, this is in the year 2000 when Bob and I were there opening up a, a one by one, just starting, as you can tell, to open up a one by one excavation right in the richest part of the midden uh, at, at Golden Grove. And when I talk about rich, just to let you know, this particular one by one goes about a meter and a half deep. And out of that, we got 3,000 pot sherds. We got. Uh, 11,000 identifiable bones. This is, so this is a little over, you know, like one and a half cubic meters, literally tens of thousands of shells, and then lo lots of lithic artifacts and things like that. This is the, literally the richest midden I've ever excavated. It's more stuff than it is, than it is uh, sediment. Really a fantastic place. So it just starting to excavate here, here you see a, uh, the, the handle of one of these D-strap pots. You can see the rich shell midden going through here, lots of pottery and, and things like that. Here it is a little, a little deeper in this midden. So uh, 
again, you, you can see, you know, this is the modern topsoil. Here's the start of the, of the rich shell midden going around. You can see it gets grayer here, browner here, and a real dense concentrations of pottery in here. Uh, this down in here was sort of a big oyster bake, uh, thousands of, of oysters. And this, as you can see now, what, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. So it's about 65 meters deep here. And like I said, we went down to about a meter 40 in, in this uh, excavation. And then it ended right on the limestone bedrock. So here, here all right, in, th in this one profile, it only goes down to a, about a meter 20. But d d distinctive layers, every one of these layers, very rich in artifacts, very rich in, in bones. The artifacts dominated by pottery, but also a lot of lithic artifacts. There was a, a quartz diorite bead workshop there. So if you're not familiar with quartz diorite, it's a white quartz with these black and very, uh, very pretty rock that these people would polish and make beads out of. The chronology of this site is down at the bottom here, we're at about AD 100 to 300. So almost 2,000 years old. At the top of the site, we're at about AD 1100, 1200 at the most. So we have roughly a thousand year section of prehistory here. There's some pretty major change, changes in the pottery, in the ceramic styles uh, through this sequence. But we have a, you know, a lot of radiocarbon dates and, and it's a, a, a thousand year slice of, of prehistory. And just to show you, this is, we actually have a lot more radiocarbon dates now, but uh, here's a table of C14 dates. This is a different site. This is the oldest archaeological site on Tobago. It goes back to about 1000 BC. Here you see Golden Grove, 130 to 370 AD at the bottom, and up to about 1000, 1100 AD uh, at, the, at the top. And these radiocarbon dates are on bones, not on charcoal. Peccary, which is a wild pig, iguana, peccary, agouti, a big rodent. And what we've learned in these sites is that because the uh, organics in the bone is so well preserved, we can do radiocarbon dates on bone. And, and we can, because the bones identified the species, that makes these sites more, even more interesting to biologists because we can say unequivocally that, you know, that peccary right there, that wild pig, or javelina is what they call the same species like in the southwest of Mexico, that that peccary or javelina was at that site that long ago, or the iguana was there then, or the agouti was, was there then. So we do a lot of radiocarbon date, dating on, on bone rather than charcoal. Here's Bob again. Now this is real hardship duty. Bob begged me not to take him here, but, but uh, this is where we screen washed a lot of the sediment from Golden Grove because it was pretty compacted, a lot of silt, and the big things like ceramics now we could pick out of the screen at what, you know, pretty much mostly up at the site. But anything in the quarter inch screen or smaller, we had to take down to this nearby beach called Buku Beach and soak it in buckets and then wade out in the ocean, in, in the, the ocean which actually was beautiful, not grainy like in the scan, and, uh, and, and, wet, and wet screen it. And as Bob will attest, it was very rich, uh, very rich site. So we not only found bones of these bigger mammals than that, but one of the neat things about Golden Grove, by fine screening it, run every, running everything through 16th inch, we found bones of little bitty things like these frogs. Or little lizards, like these anoles, or here's a young iguana. Uh, other kinds of lizards like these uh, tegu lizards, lots of snakes, especially boa constrictors, lots of, uh, and, and another type of boa, and a lot of these colubrid or non-poisonous snakes, so these aren't in the python boa family or in the rattlesnake uh, cottonmouth family, these are like, you know, sort of rat snake, garter snake kind of family, harmless snakes, but this site, by fine screening it, we, we discovered that these people were bringing back to the site any size vertebrate they could find, from the littlest frogs, littlest lizards, littlest birds, up to real big snakes like a, a boa, big lizards like an iguana or something, and the biggest uh, mammals that were available. So let me show, I'm going to talk now about the mammals that we discovered 
there on Tobago. And, and, and it, again, remember, we have a thousand year slice of time here, so we can look at trends in these, in these mammals through time. So here's our beloved opossum, same th species that's in Florida. Nine-banded nine armadillo, again, same armadillo that we have in Florida. It's introduced here, but it's native down in Tobago. The agouti, a large rodent, uh, about, really about the size of a possum or a raccoon, something like that. And then finally, this javelina or peccary, the, the wild pig, a collared peccary. And, this, uh, and these peccar an adult of these peccaries weighs like 25 to 40 pounds. So to just to give you an idea, it's not like this you know, massive domestic pig, but it's still, it's the biggest mammal on, that was ever, that's ever been recorded on Tobago. So it's sort of their equivalent maybe to a white-tailed deer. So looking at the trends in these mammals through time, and let me explain this, TOB3 is that site that's 3,000 years old, that goes back to 1,000 BC, and that's this. So, and, and this is the opossum. We didn't find any opossum bones in the old site. We found some bones of the agouti, that's Dazipus, the agouti, I mean the, the uh, armadillo. And here's Daziprocta, the uh, agouti. So we found some bones of armadillo and of agouti, but look at all the bones we found it, in the early site of the peccary, of the, of the wild pig. It dominates the mammals in that, in that early site. And then, these are the older layers of Golden Grove. These are the layers that are about AD 2300. These are the upper layers, the layers that are about AD 1100. And you can see that with possums, they weren't, that we have no evidence that they were catching them at the old site, or if they did, they were rare. And they show up prehistorically in, this, in the younger Golden Grove site. They increase with uh, the armadillo increases with time at Golden Grove. The agouti is a lot more in the early part of Golden Grove and then declines. But look at how rare the javelina bones are, the peccary bones are at Golden Grove. So they're very common in the early site, much rarer in the early part of the younger site, and then by later in prehistory, about 1,000 BP, 1,000 AD, they're much rarer, and in very late prehistoric sites on the island, sites that date to AD 13, 14, 1500, we don't find them. So this is a classic case of what zooarchaeologists might call resource depression, but simply it's, it's overhunting these things. So these agoutis, or, or these uh, javelina, these peccary, were the prime game animal 3,000 years ago, and they got hunted to the point where they became, where they became rare. It's, this isn't rocket science, it's just like game, modern game management, you know, and it's like the Lewis and Clark expedition, you know, in, in the early 1800s. If you read Lewis and Clark's journals, the places where they found it easy to hunt elk and bison and deer and all that, and where they could feed their party really easily, were in these warring zones, these no man's land, where, where adjacent Indian tribes were, were fighting. And, and the Indians were afraid to go there, and the game populations had, had increased. The places where Lewis and Clark were chewing on shoe leather and, and, and starving were the places near Indian villages where the Indians had in fact overhunted the elk and the bison and stuff like that and the Indians were also having a hard time feeding themselves. Lastly, to leave Tobago, we also have bones of howler monkeys uh, in, in, this, in, the, in these sites which are no longer on Tobago. So, the, on Tobago, what we've learned through the zooarchaeological record is that we have some larger species like howler monkeys and peccaries that have been wiped out uh, through time, probably by overhunting through by Amerindians, but they, those species still survive in adjacent South America. So it's not full species level extinction. Nevertheless, there's some overexploitation of larger species. Most of the little species whether it's birds, lizards, snakes, or whatever, even though they've been hunted on Tobago for thousands of years, they seem pretty resilient to that, and they're, they're, they're going on through time. 
All right, so now I didn't do this just to goof with you people, but so I, you know, I cut Tampa off the first, uh, St. Pete off the first map. Here we are on this map, right at the edge of the earth. Sorry about that again. Uh, I, I, this isn't out of disrespect, but uh, what we want now is abandon the Caribbean a little bit, go out to the South Pacific, and I want to show you one example of a, dr of a dramatic example of overexploitation of animals on an oceanic island in the, in the South Pacific. Oh, and by the way, well, I can't go back, but, but we're going to go to the uh, Kingdom of Tonga. And if you notice that red, it, the, the, all the red stuff in that map of the Pacific, those are places with major earthquakes and volcanoes. So that's where it's real tectonically active. That main big red area is where the Pacific plate is moving westward relative to the Indo-Australia plate. It's subducting beneath the Indo-Australia plate, and then behind that plate margin, some of it's being remelted and coming up again as volcanoes. You can see that real easily in the Kingdom of Tonga. So uh, it, here it are three islands in Tonga. We're sailing in a little Tongan fishing boat here, and in the foreground is a little raised limestone on this little raised limestone shelf, almost like the Bahamas, although this is, these are raised limestone coral reefs, not limestone sand. But then in the background, are two active volcanoes. This volcano is called Kao, K-A-O, K -O, K -O, not C-O-W, and it's a very young volcano. For perspective, that's about 2,400 feet elevation there, about a half mile high on Kao. It's a young volcano. It hasn't quite blown its top yet. It hasn't grown up very much. This volcano, Tofua, is much larger, but most of its, what looks like from a boat, land area is in fact a lake in the middle, a giant, a giant crater lake. So Tofua has had a massive eruption, a caldera collapse, and uh, it's a, a more mature stage of volcano, although it's still, uh, it's still active. This is my favorite type of island in Tonga. These are raised limestone islands. These are places where near a volcano where the Earth's crust has been uplifted, you have coral reefs that are uplifted. And, and so instead of be, being subaqueous, submarine, they're subaerial. So these rapidly uplifted coral reefs are fantastic places for fossils and, and for archaeological sites because they form limestone caves and rock shelters, very sweet soil, great preservation uh, of bones. And you can see this modern wave cut notch just about four feet high that goes all the way around, uh, all the way around this, this island. So another reason why I love these raised limestone islands and work on them more than any other island is they tend to have less human impact on them because you know, raise your hand if you want to land a boat here and get ashore. And, and, you know, so what happens, you know, I can tell you from experience, is you get cut head to toe, you fall, you break something, and, and it's really tough. So even in calm water here, as you can imagine, again, that's about four feet, well, a little more, about a meter and a half, to, in, even in calm water, to scramble up that cliff and get on that shore is really tough. Now the good news is some of these raised limestone islands on the leeward side have a beach where you can get access, end up getting access to the whole island. But a lot of them are surrounded like this. So it's a combination of having great sites for archaeology, uh, especially caves and rock shelters, and the fact that this really rugged coastline has retarded you know, human impact that makes these islands uh, really interesting. So, this is a different raised limestone island, and we're going, uh, this is as we're approaching the leeward beach with uh, Tongan uh, fishermen. Really fun, fun field work. Couldn't, couldn't be a bigger, bigger hoot. And uh, you, get, you go ashore, and almost always one of the first birds to greet you is this thing, a collared kingfisher. Very common, vocal, uh, uh, pretty bold, uh, bold bird. And then, you in, and, and it's sort of all over the island. Inside the interior of the forest, you run into birds like this, the Tongan whistler, more of a, a true forest, uh, forest bird. But on a typical one of these Tongan islands, what we're finding is uh, maybe 10, 12, 13 species of birds is all we find uh, per island. And, and when I started working in Tonga it, uh, 21 years ago, it was 
such a backwater biologically, and more than half of the islands that I visited in Tonga were never before set foot on by a biologist of any kind, by an archaeologist, by any kind of ologist. I mean, there wasn't a list of the plants, a list of the birds, no one had looked for sites or anything. So it was really neat stuff because, you know, I've, I've never, I mean, I, I love, you know, I'm, I'm glad outer space is there and I'm glad the deep ocean is there, but I have no desire to go to either place. And it's neat to just use low-tech surface transportation and still get to places that are scientifically uh, pretty much out, out there, unknown. Now, on the more traditional islands uh, in Polynesia, you run into kids like this. And uh, so you see that younger boy who's about four, you see a slingshot he has around his neck. And his older brother, who's seven or eight, is hiding his slingshot behind his uh, back because he thinks the big, mean, white fella that just showed up on the island is going to take it from him. But talking to these kids, these are the kids that know so much about birds because, except for helping their parents work in the field, they spend all day with their slingshots trying to kill birds. And, it's, they're, and they're deadly with their slingshots. And, and, uh, but it, you know, and so it's, it's easy for us, the modern civilized, to criticize these and say, oh, that's, you know, that's horrible after killing these little birds. But you know, A, there's no school to attend. And B, they, these kids are becoming such good naturalists. And even like this seven or eight year old, talking to him through an interpreter, because I have a lot of Polynesian nouns, I can't make a complete sentence. I can't understand the verbs at all. But, but we had a guy, a bilingual guy with us, and talking to this kid, he knew, he knew every species of bird that was on the island. He knew all about it, ranging from where to find them to what they tasted like. And, and so it's a great resource. And as we get into the archaeology here, I've, uh, on, what I've discovered on these traditional islands is the, it's the, uh, probably a lot of the bones we're finding in these archaeological sites, burned, chopped up bones of birds, many of which are extinct species, were probably brought in by these kids. These kids are, are, are just deadly. And, the, and what, with, like with these two kids, I got to know them really well. And here was their policy. Any little bird that they killed with their slingshot, they would make a little fire. And these are kids that can still, no matches, no nothing, rub sticks together, make a fire. They make a fire, they, uh, pardon my anatomical graphicness here, but you know, put a little stick up the bird's butt, singe the feathers off, and just eat it like a marshmallow. That was, that was it. If it was a bird that was, say, you know, the size of a robin or a blue jay or something, then they took it home and let their parents uh, eat it. So, so here's the deal. 3,000 years ago in Tonga, the first people show up. Other than that, it's purely oceanic islands, millions of years of colonizations, extinction, natural processes. 3,000 years ago, people known as the Lapita people, based on their pottery, I'll show you a piece in a minute, show up on, a, on an island uh, on an island group, there are 170 islands in Tonga, they show up in an island group where the only native mammals are bats. There are no native land-based carnivores, so the birds and reptiles there are very naive to land-based predation. You can walk right up to them, it doesn't occur to them that you could be a predator because they've never had to deal with members of the dog, cat, raccoon, weasel family, whatever. So they're very naive to predation. So when these people show up 3,000 years ago, on these islands, one of the things that's going to start doing in the birds is just good old human predation. Kids and uh, setting snares uh, and otherwise finding and killing birds. These people also brought with them pigs, which are not native, native to Southeast Asia. So pigs are rooting around. That's no bargain for the native fauna. They also brought dogs with them a native, uh, a non-native carnivore, that's no bargain for birds, especially because a lot of them are flightless, nested on the ground and all that. By the way, you can look at that a classic island inbreeding for that poor dog. Uh, you know, one more generation and it wouldn't have legs. Uh, and and uh, in fact, serious, I mean, I'm not kidding, my, one of my Tongan buddies went to New Zealand and brought that long-legged dog to the island. He said, I can't stand it. You know, it's such an embarrassment. All our dogs have such short legs. So, uh, you know, I, I wished them well in the dog breeding program. I, I haven't been back to that island in a long time, so I don't know how it worked out. But, uh, and then 
these, Poly these Polynesians 3,000 years ago are also bringing with them rats. Rats are probably the worst of all because they develop these huge populations, they'll eat anything. And these are two rats I killed for fun and game uh, in Tonga just because I needed a rat picture. And, and uh, they're, so this is, whoops, oh, anyway, the small one on top is the Polynesian rat, the one that came 3,000 years ago. The one on the bottom, which is also widespread in Tonga now, is the black rat or roof rat, which only came with European exploration. That's the same rat that brought us the bubonic plague and all kinds of other things. That's, you know, it's, a, it's, it's the, if you had to pick a bad rat, it's that one. Uh, these people were also agriculturalists. Three th that arrived 3,000 years ago. So right away, in the dry season, they start, they start chopping down and burning the forest so they can plant their uh, root crops. Like here, this is a form of dryland taro, and, and uh, they brought with them six or seven sta uh, crop staples that originated in Indonesia and, and New Guinea. So, so when people come out to, these, to a place like Tonga 3,000 years ago, it's no bargain for the native fauna, especially the birds, because the people are hunting birds. And you can imagine, if, you, if you've been out to sea for days and days, sailing in, in, in dugout canoes, and you get to an island with tame birds, and you're pretty much sick of fish, you're gonna start eating birds. And, and, and so there's a lot of direct predation. Then they're bringing pigs, dogs, and rats with them, no bargain for the native birds or lizards. And then the other thing I didn't mention was they brought chickens with them. I didn't show a picture of a chicken because as an ornithologist, I question whether it's a bird. The jury is still out. Uh, I, have, I'm still, I have some pride about a few things. But, uh, but the, the trouble with the you know, chicken, now I'm not saying they brought murderous chickens that were going around killing innocent, colorful little birds. But chicken is native to Southeast Asia, and there's a good chance that some bird diseases came out to these islands with, the chi with chickens, because just like at European contact, a lot of Amerindians were very susceptible to smallpox, syphilis, a lot of, uh, in fact, as we know, a, a lot of villages, entire tribes were wiped out before any documentation, just through disease in North, Central, and South America. It was the same. It's, it's, it was the same in Polynesia, like in the Marquesas, within 30 years of European discovery, the he, Polynesian population of the Marquesas went from 200,000 to 2,000, mostly through smallpox and syphilis. Likewise, for these island birds that were leading a fairly pathogen-free life, chances are the arrival of, of the chicken was, was no bargain. So here's an archeological site, a three by three meter Pitt, this is David Burley, an archaeologist from uh, British Columbia that I work with quite a bit. This is last year's excavation, which we were requested by the village, and you can see a couple of houses in the background here. This is on a little island called Lifuka, and uh, in the Hapai group of Tonga, we were requested by the village not to fill in that three by three, which had been excavated the previous summer because the chief of the village was, was so excited because he thought that this could be the basis of the biggest outhouse in Tonga. I'm serious, he was so excited instead of these little sort of one seaters that everybody had. And, and, and so he said, are you sure? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah I'll leave it open, leave it open. Oh God, you know, and, and so we come back next year, of course, the Taj Mahal of outhouses had not been built. And, and, uh, but it was great because what we could do is clean off one of these walls and do a much more careful excavation than we did the year before. So we're cleaning off this wall to, and just slight, we're gonna slice off 2.2 meters deep, which is a little more than seven feet deep. Uh, there's some overburden in the bottom. Uh, and, and slice it off in five centimeter levels to really take a close look at the stratigraphy of this site. So here's what it looked like when we started to get it cleaned off. At the bottom here is sterile beach sand. Right here is 2,900 years old. This is the first arrival of people on Lifuka. We have, lot, we have 20 radiocarbon dates from this section. You can see this gray sediment here, browner here, dark brown up here. There's pottery all through the sequence. There are animal bones no human bones, there are no burials here. Animal bones all through the sequence, but the bones of extinct species of birds are confined to this bottom half meter, like bottom two feet 
of this section. And above that, the bones that we find of birds and lizards and mammals that are ones that live on the island today. Below that, most of the bones are of extinct, are of extinct species. At this same break, where we lose the bones of extinct species, we also lose the Lapita pottery, this real distinctive style of pottery that these first people made. So we have uh, sediments dominated by bones of extinct birds and Lapita pottery up to here, and then the bones that we get from here on up are almost exclusively bones of species that still live on the island today. Pottery becomes rare, and what little pottery that is in there is undecorated, a very, a very different style. Because there was such a major change in pottery, and because there was such a major change in the kind of bones we were getting, I thought when we excavated this site, at, with it, once we got back and radiocarbon dated it thoroughly, that I, I figured because Le, the age of Lapita pottery was known from other sites, I figured, okay, this will be 2,900, 3,000 years old at the bottom. Nobody knew when Lapita uh, pottery really gave out and gave way to that plane where it was very poorly dated. So I was guessing we'll probably have a couple hundred, two, three hundred years here, and then maybe two, three, four hundred years more up here. I thought maybe it's a couple thousand years at the top, although I didn't really know. Well, so we did 20 radiocarbon dates on this site, and to make a long story short, we did it from top to bottom. Statistically, because you know every radiocarbon date is a statistical average, so you get a date of 2,900 plus or minus 40 years, or so, you know, 2,800 plus or minus 50 years not. Statistically, these 20 dates, we can't separate top to bottom. Based on radiocarbon chronology, this thing is instantaneous. So to a geologist, it is instantaneous. To an archaeologist, in, so geologists typically are interested in real long time frames. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, maybe millions of years. To a geologist, when you have radiocarbon dates at the bottom, 28, 2900 years ago, plus or minus 40 years, and you have radiocarbon dates at the top of 2800 years, plus or minus 50 years, Again, statistically, you can't separate it. Does that mean it's identical? No. Of course, it took some time for the sediment to accumulate. But what we can say is it almost for sure happened in less than a century. And it happened in a time frame that, that geologically is instantaneous, culturally would seem to be pretty instantaneous, yet we have this big break in the fauna and in the pottery. And so by looking at, by doing a careful analysis of the bones, and the pottery and the radiocarbon dates, what we can say is that the extinction of birds on this island, and by the way, there are 13 living species of birds on Lefuka. We identified 35 species from their bones. 22, so 22 of those 35 species of birds no longer live on Lefuka. We found their bones in this bottom part, but we didn't find them up above that. So the loss of roughly two-thirds of the species of birds on that island happened in what's, again, to a geologist, instantaneous. It, I would get my, my best guess is it probably happened within no more than a single human lifetime, at most a couple human lifetimes. So, uh, and, and this is where, this is where my heart starts to go pitter-patter when you start combining time scales to where what, what, can you, what can you know within a single human lifetime? And how, can you then, how does that then start to relate to, say, archaeological time frames or paleontological time frames? When I was a troubled youth on a farm in northwestern Pennsylvania, my best friend in the 1950s was this old guy, Willie Weaver, that lived up the road. He was born in 1883. And he remembered passenger pigeons on our farm. And passenger pigeons died out the last real flocks of passenger pigeons were seen anywhere in the world in 1907. But he talked to me about, as a teenager, how his farm, which connected to ours and our farm, in the spring you'd see these big flocks of passenger pigeons that would darken the sky. I mean, just like the accounts. And so I'm thinking, wow, that's so cool. Here I am, you know, I'm born in the 50s, 40 years after the extinction of passenger pigeons. I can only look at skins in museums and, and you know, stuff like that. This guy saw them when he was alive. Then I got thinking about Tonga. So I can imagine sitting around a Tongan campfire, the people 
Some grandfather, I only, I'm not a sexual pig, I only say grandfather because in Polynesia, where division of labor is serious, the boys and men hunt, the women do more important things. And, uh, <laughs> but I can imagine a grandfather that was living around here, which might only be a few decades after this big extinction, sitting there talking to his son or his grandson about how the hunting really stinks on the island now. But when he was a kid, there was, you know, there was a pigeon the size of a turkey, and there was a blah, 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 all these 22 birds, including like three species of parrots, five species of rails. Uh, there was a pigeon the size of a turkey. Uh, and and uh, in fact, there are three species of pigeons and doves on the island now. There used to be nine. Now, we all know pigeons and doves uh, you know, especially traditional, to traditional people, taste good. So they, they, by this time here, which again is almost geologically instantaneous from the first arrival of people, they'd wiped out six out of nine of their species of pigeons and doves. So there must have been some great conversations around the campfire about, about the good old days that you can think about uh, just, just looking looking uh, at this. And then w uh, one of the big mysteries, of course, would be if these are the same people. If the people that made the Lapita pottery are the same people that are making this dull and boring pottery, the kind of pottery that probably even Bob Austin could make if we, if we let him. Uh, that, you know, why did they quit making that beautiful decorated pottery and go to that plane where, I mean, was it somehow related to the fact that they'd already trashed their fauna? Or was it some new new colonization of people or whatever. So there, there's a lot still to, to think about. Here's what the, that Lapita pottery looks like. This is a rim shirt. It, it, uh, it had this, this uh, you can see these little notches that they would carve in the rim. And then this is called dentate stamping. And so they'd make these lines going down. And then you can see these little uh, semicircles going up like that. And they made this. You can simulate this today really well with the shell of a hawksbill turtle. You, uh, you can, if you, which are illegal. I mean, they're they're you know federally and internationally protected now as they should be. But if you file notches on the side of a shell of a hawksbill turtle and roll it like that, you can make uh, this Lapita pottery. I've pointed out to many ornith, uh, uh, archaeologists that in fact this pottery is saying big bird, big. <laughs> bird. I'm just sure of that. And, and uh, uh, I, they never laugh like you did. So it's, they take it much too serious. But anyway, so in the same uh, lower part of the site where we're getting Lapita pottery, we're also getting these bird bones. This is one of the leg bones of that chicken that was the size of a turkey. As, just as it come, comes out of the dirt. It's not cleaned up, really ready, ready to study yet. But this is the kind of thing we find. So in a single site, that chronologically is essentially one snapshot in time, you have a huge change in the culture and a huge change in the fauna. And that's the stuff I really like. So here's just one example of one of the, you know, here's the, this is the biggest pigeon in the area today. This is one of the leg bones, Tarsa metatarsus. Here's the leg bone. And, and to let you know, this is about twice the size of a, of a city pigeon, of a regular pigeon you might find downtown St. Pete. And here's the same bone of one of these big, uh, big pigeons. And th these things are also, but one of the reasons why this stuff is interesting to biologists is not just to bird people or other vertebrate folks, but the uh, botanists now are getting very interested in this because on a lot of these islands, there are tree, native trees that have big globular uh, fruits uh, ranging in size from clear up to a softball, and today there's nothing that eats, there's no, no species that eats those fruits. These are uh, trees that have fleshy fruits with a hard seed inside. They're clearly adapted to be eaten by a bird. The bird takes off the sort of the equivalent, uh, in fact some of them are in like the avocado family, so you can imagine that. The bird takes off the, the rich part and then spits out the seed. And that's a way to disperse these, these trees. So botanists have been wondering why they, they're, there are these little populations of a lot of these trees with big fruits that are in danger maybe of melting down genetically. You know, and how did they get there? And now that we've excavated all these bones of big pigeons that we know that, that they were the ones dispersing these fruits. So just to show you, this is what some of the extant pigeons look like today. This is the 
it living one I showed you right here. Uh, they're not dull and boring like in the New World. Uh, and then parrots are another family of birds where, uh, and I think we're going to leave Polynesia now, but another family of birds where we find a lot of extinction. And so this is in the Marquesas, and in the genus Vini, this is a, a, these little nectar feeding parrots. They have a brushy tipped tongue. They, they feed on flowers. Uh, and Vini ultramarina, a beautiful little purple parrot, is the living species. And in the archaeological sites, we get two larger species that are, that are extinct, that have never been seen alive. They're only known from bones we've excavated. And so we have the giant Vini Sonoto, I named after the, uh, Yoshi Sonoto, the archaeologist that excavated it. And then the poor conquered parrot, Vini Vidi Vici, which is inter <laughs> intermediate in, in, in size. And, and uh, so, and, and again, th this is, uh, so traditional people love parrots. They like to talk to their parrots. They love the feathers and all that. And then someday when they're hungry, they eat their parrot, unlike most of us. So. We, we get lots of bones of these parrots, and just like with pigeons and doves, the majority of the species uh, are extinct. And this brings up another question is, if you, if you really like your parrots in, in a lot of ways, in other words, you love using their feathers for a lot of things, you love the way they sound, who knows, you know, they're great, and they do taste good, but why would you want to wipe them out? In other words, these are bright people. Why would you want to make all these species go extinct if they're so important to you. And this, to me now, is uh, for at least some of these species, like parrots, goes back to the rats. I don't think these people were that naive that they just plain went through, steamrolled through and wiped out everything they had. I think because this uh, Pacific rat can climb trees, can get into nest cavities where the parrots are and stuff like that, and, and, and as the rat populations exploded, I think beyond the control of the people, these, these, uh, some of these species got wiped out. Okay, so the, we're going to leave the Pacific now. Uh, by the way, this is the leeward side of Lifuka, the island where we just excavated that archaeological site. And, uh, if, if, and for, for young people in the audience, uh, it, that are maybe still interested in you know going to college or you're in college or something like that. It, it, there are so many islands in the Pacific that are still unexplored. So if you have a little bit of wanderlust and you know and, and you don't need to you know go to Chick Fil A that often and you're willing to abandon your cell phone, uh, think about a place like this. Okay, this is a blue hole on the island of Abaco in the northern Bahamas. So we're going to wrap up on cl much closer to home on Abaco. This is a project that I started three years ago and I was just there last week. I've been, to, I've been to Abaco a lot in the last few years because this project is just so interesting and we're nowhere near diminishing returns. It's still producing a lot of exciting discoveries. Uh, this is Brian K. Cook who built this dive platform. This is a blue hole called Sawmill Sink. Brian is an ex-Navy SEAL. He's one of the world's premier scuba divers. This is one of these guys, in fact, he has been, he's been able to dive 500 feet deep more times than anyone else who's still alive. And, and, and I don't say that lightly because some of these divers almost do seem to have a death wish. Brian is, I mean, you'd never guess it. And he's, uh, he knows all the technology. He's, com he's very methodical, very safe and all that. But there's almost nothing Brian can do with, when he has his scuba, scuba gear on. Brian, in 2000, late 2004, tried to dive into Sawmill Sink and get below the hydrogen sulfide layer out and and let me well so one more thing you can see it's pretty circular just a circular hole in the limestone in the Bahamas and there's a little three four five foot cliff all the way around it so you can imagine this is a pretty good natural trap for a lot of animals or that would go in there even something that's a good swimmer you have a cliff that in fact bells out like that and just like on that raised limestone island, good luck, good luck getting out 
once, once, you, once you go in. So, uh, in fact, before he built that dive platform, the only place where he had access was this one little spot right here, which was, which was pretty marginal. People had, scuba divers had tried to go into sawmill sink before, and no one was able to dive it. And here's the reason why. Here's a profile of it. So it has a fresh water lens that's about 30 feet deep. Most blue holes, almost all blue holes, unless they're out in the ocean, have a fresh water lens floating on top. Then there's this yellow layer of mixed chemistry, and then below it is salt water. The salt water has no oxygen in it. The, the mixed layer here is, is opaque, eliminates all the light. There's good light in the fresh water, and this is opaque, so the salt water is completely opaque. There's no light getting to it, nor is there any oxygen, and the, this mixed layer is loaded with hydrogen sulfide, from, which is the same chemical as rotten eggs, from organic material falling into the sinkhole, going down here, and then as it starts to decay, hydrogen sulfide bubbles come up here, and as the hydrogen sulfide bubbles start to hit the fresh water, which has oxygen in it, it, it a lot of it stays as hydrogen sulfide, but quite a bit of it forms H2SO4, which is sulfuric acid, which isn't most divers' favorite thing to take a bath in. And, and it's not only not recommended for your skin, but it's bad on your diving gear, too. So the reason why no one had been able to dive through here is once, you know, fresh water is a piece of cake for a diver. Once you get here, you not only lose all your light, your face starts to burn, any exposed skin starts to burn, and and ugh. so Brian rigged up a way with rebreathers so he doesn't give off any bubbles, covers all his skin, and plus is just beyond macho. And he was the uh, first, you know, meanwhile, I need to say full, you know, full disclosure, I am chicken of the sea. I have doggy paddled on the surface. I've never been deeper than three feet in sawmill sink, and I never will be unless I become part of the fossil record. So when, when Brian dives, I hang out at the dive platform and wish him luck and, you know, read and stuff. I mean, it's completely wimpy field work for me. Uh, but once you get through here, down in this anoxic salt water, in other words, no oxygen, the preservation of plant and animal fossils is exquisite. It's off the scale. Nobody, there's no site in the West Indies that has this level of preservation, as I'll show you in a minute. So that once on his first dive, when Brian got below the rotten eggs and the, hydro and the sulfuric acid, uh, here's what he saw. This is a, an entire shell of an extinct, undescribed species of tortoise that's, that's endemic to that bank in the Bahamas. And see, it's, it's just lying there, perfect preservation in, in peat. See the, how well-preserved the plant material is, too. And it's a little hard to see in this photo, but you can see some. This is, these are actually the healed bite marks from a Cuban crocodile. And what we've been able to reconstruct, we now have 20, no, 17 individual tortoises from this site. We have 57 individual Cuban crocodiles. Most of these are complete or almost complete skeletons, just there as they died. You can imagine a tortoise, yeah, as you know, tortoises don't test well, just like most of my students. And, and so a tortoise is lopping along, boom, falls into the sinkhole, even though they can doggy paddle for a while about at my speed. Nevertheless, eventually, they're not going to get out. So eventually, they're going to tire and they're going to go to Davy Jones Locker. Crocodiles, and if you ever look at a crocodile or alligator skull, as you know, boy, they don't test well. And so they, you know, they think about food and sex and nothing else. And so a crocodile sees a tortoise doggy paddling and he goes, oh, a meal. Crocodile goes in, he might bite the tortoise, he might beat up, you know, whatever. He might abuse the tortoise for a while, but it, it's not until after all the fun is done with the tortoise that it possibly occurs to the croc. It's a one-way trip for him, too. He's not getting out, even though he's a good, a good swimmer. So we have this exquisitely preserved fossil record in here of the largest herbivore, this extinct tortoise, and the largest carnivore, 
the, uh, the Cuban crocodile, which survives today on Cuba, but is never known in historic times from the Bahamas. And I'll, I'll get more into that now. But remember how close the Bahamas is to Florida, but it's strictly oceanic. In other words, in the con Florida, like anywhere else in the continent, the big apex predators and herbivores are big mammals. Deer, bison, elk, stuff like that. You know, cows, horses, whatever. And the big carnivores are, you know, members of the cat family, dog family, wolves, coyotes, panthers, uh, things like bobcats, things like that. Out on these oceanic islands, the mammals are replaced by reptiles. So it sets up a completely different vertebrate community with all different rules because we've got cold-blooded animals calling the shots instead of warm-blooded animals. Here's another one of the tortoises. Look at this one. It even has the epidermal scutes preserved yet on the shell. So that's the fingernail-like material, the outer part of the, of the shell. Here's yet another tortoise, a complete shell inside this one. In here were most of the uh, leg bones and, and the skull. Uh, th th there's no site anywhere in the West Indies with this kind of exquisite preservation of extinct, uh, of extinct animals. It's, it, it's just revolutionized things. And Dick Franz up at our museum just published a paper describing this extinct species of tortoise. So it has a name, uh, a name on it now. Also lying in the peat are, you know, there's this uh, complete skull of a Cuban crocodile, just as it's lying in C2. You see C29. This is the 29th individual crocodile. One of the great things about this is that Brian, because of his 20 years as a Navy SEAL, being involved in all kinds of very state-of-the-art, sophisticated diving stuff, including all the secret squirrel crap that you know none of us will ever understand. Uh, but, but he's so organized, he's so meticulous, and he's such a good scientist that when he discovered these tortoises and crocodiles, unlike almost any other diver in the world, he never touched any of them. All he did was photograph them. And then, with, our, with, 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 with us you know, up top saying, <laughs> knock him dead, Brian, uh, he set up a three-dimensional grid through the whole sinkhole, just like you do at an archaeological site. So everything that comes up has horizontal and vertical coordinates. We know right where everything, right where everything is before anything was collected. That's rare in any kind of site. I mean, most archaeological sites are discovered by you know, somebody digging a septic tank or a road going through it. Or there's almost always the first level of just wanton destruction before you can maybe slow down and, and do some good work. This site started off on the wrong foot, and it, and it, or on the right foot, and it stayed there. Here's a different crocodile skull, just as it was found. Uh, in fact, yeah, this is the first one found. This is C1, as it was found lying there. These fossils are put in big Tupperwares with the original water chemistry around them. Because remember, for, for, oh, so the radiocarbon dates on these crocodiles and tortoises, all the dates we've done so far are from two to 4,000 years old. Well, 2,000 to 4,400 years old. So they're late Holocene. Uh, we, they've been in oxygen-free salt water for millennia. We, we keep them in oxygen-free salt water to bring them up, and then we slowly change out the water to convert it to fresh water. If you just brought them up in that salt water and let them dry like that, the, the, because the salt is so concentrated, the salt would crystallize inside the bone and, and shatter the bone. So, the la so you have to slowly but surely switch out the salt water to fresh and then slowly let it dry. The worst thing you'd want to do is like, just bring it out of the salt water and set it in an air-conditioned room. It would, turn to dust. And then as they, this is Nancy Alberry, uh, another one of the divers. There are three main divers in this project. Brian K. Cook, who you've seen, is the head diver. Nancy is a resident on uh, Abaco. She's also a diver. And then Kenny Broad from University of Miami is a third diver. So here's one of the crocodile skulls just as it came up. Uh, it's still in its, in its original salt water. Here's what some of these things look like when they're, when they're cleaned off. And so here's one of the, one of the tortoises. Uh, we now have three tortoises that have crocodile bite marks on them. And, and in all three cases, the bites are healed. So these, are, th these probably aren't the attacks that, that 
killed the tortoise. Maybe a crocodile didn't kill a tortoise, but, but you can see the tooth outline of the crocodile on the carapace of the, of the tortoise. One cool thing about this Cuban crocodile is uh, w within any kind of crocodiles I I in the, uh, worldwide, the longer and narrower the snout is, the more of a fish eater it is. And also the teeth aren't very differentiated. If the teeth are just all pretty much the same little pointy teeth, that, those tend to be fish eating species. The, the broader and shorter the snout is, and the more differentiated the teeth are, the more terrestrial they tend to be, and the more varied their diet tends to be. So crocodiles, you can see they have almost what are the equivalent of mammalian canine teeth here. And you see that the uh, tooth, mar the margin of the, of the maxilla and premaxilla here is pretty, it's not just a straight line like in a fish eater. You can see looking down on it, it's not that long, narrow snout. Uh, so it's this, cro and it's also a pretty deep skull for a crocodile. It's not so, as narrow and hydrodynamic as a more aquatic crocodile. So it makes sense that these Cuban crocodiles were the main terrestrial predator in, in, the, in the Bahamas. And the only fresh water in the Bahamas are the, is the water on the surface of these sinkholes. There are no fresh water streams or anything like that. So, so we have the, this apex predator, Cuban crocodile. We have these big tortoises. We also pulled up a human tibia out of sawmill sink. It radiocarbon dated to a thousand years ago, an Amerindian uh, tibia. The youngest radiocarbon date we have on crocodiles and tortoises is 2000. The oldest date we have on humans is 1000. So there's a thousand year gap between the arrival of humans and, and the youngest date we have on these, but we haven't done that many radiocarbon dates. I'm virtually positive once we do more, we'll tie in that gap. I can't, I'm virtually certain that the loss of tortoises and Cuban crocodiles here was due to the arrival of people. I'm not saying that to be critical at all, just like I wasn't of Polynesians. It would be tough to raise a toddler if you had crocodiles running around your backyard. And, and so it's logical that shortly after the arrival of people, they're gonna to try to kill off these Cuban crocodiles that are terrorizing Abaco and other islands in the Bahamas. Likewise, what easier thing to hunt than tortoises? So people, you know, could easily hunt the tortoises. You don't want, you don't want crocs ruining your picnic. And so sometime, probably, I don't know the chronology yet on Abaco or anywhere else in the Bahamas in detail, but probably within a couple centuries, maybe even less, uh, the tortoises and crocodiles were were gone. The the croc would be great in tourist brochures today. Uh, now. Also down in there, I, I need to tell you a little bit about the birds. Uh, there are a lot of bird bones in sawmill sink too. The crocodile and tortoise are uh, big, spectacular things. But this is a humerus here of a, of a white ibis common bird that we all know in Florida. Uh, the most spectacular bird fossil we have right here, uh, have from here so far, is this thing called Creighton's Caracara. It's closely related to our crested Caracara that we have a little population of in Florida here, but this is an endemic Bahamian species, smaller winged than, than the main one. Look at the preservation of that skull. It's just, just gorgeous. Here's what a living crested Caracara uh, looks like. So the peat with these tortoises and crocodiles and a lot of these birds is, it tends to be at about 70, 80 feet on that talus cone in the, in the sinkhole. Down at about 105, 110, 115 feet, the sediment becomes less organic, pretty much inorganic, and in, on ledges back in there, uh, Brian discovered places like this, organic sediment, and it's hard to see in this photo, but lying on there are just thousands and thousands of little bones. And little bones of amphibians, reptiles, bats, birds, and stuff like that. This is an owl roost, and this has to have been formed when sea level was lower. So again, we're at 105, 110 feet depth. The last time sea level was that much lower was about 11, 12,000 years ago. So, and, and you know, I, so far, no owls have been able to train successfully with scuba. So I don't think these owls were roosting underwater. And so 
to, so what we're dealing with here is a late Pleistocene Alroost fauna. So even though we're in the same sinkhole, it's a very independent derivation of the fauna, very different time frame, different mode of deposition, etc. And this is all microfauna. These are all species that are of a size that could they could be could be consumed by a, a large barn owl. Uh, so, but it's neat to get this sort of an older snapshot. And of course, this is way before there was any human influence, at least anything known, in the Bahamas. Now, on the continent, it's a, it's a different story. So this is what these bones from the owl roost look like when they come out. There's some limestone nodules here, but here you can see bones of uh, various birds uh, just as they come out in the, uh, from, the, uh, from these Ziploc bags of, of sediment that they get. We have a flightless rail out there, uh, hundreds of bones of it, sort of something similar to a living clapper rail, but an endemic flightless species. The most common bird in the whole site is a burrowing owl. Uh, in fact, if we might ask Carl Hyacin, author of Hoot, to fund the next trip. Uh, but the, we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bones of burrowing owls. Now, most of the species we have in this site are too big to be eaten by burrowing owls. And if you know much about the biology of burrowing owls, bigger owls love to eat burrowing owls. Poor little burrowing owls are, they, they, you know, it's no, no bargain being a burrowing owl. And, and so there's some bigger owl, I think it's a large barn owl, but we haven't found a single bone of it that's depositing these burrowing owls in the cave. Third most common bird is the eastern meadowlark, same species that we have here in Florida. It only lives in Cuba and the West Indies today. One of the biggest surprises is we have a single fossil, but it's very distinctive, of this little bitty parrot. Uh, it's a parrotlet. It, it, there are five species in the Neotropics today live in tropical dry forests, none known in the, anywhere in the West Indies, anywhere in the Caribbean. But yet we have uh, some unknown species of little parrot uh, in the Bahamas. And so to, to close here, this is a picture I took from the dive platform. Here you see. Uh, three divers uh, that have that are you know there you see the bubbles as they re-equilibrate they're coming up uh, and one of the biggest problems of course is if you you know when you decompress when you come up after 100 diving at 110 120 feet deep you decompression is a serious issue and you have to do it periodically and it takes a long time and so one of the real troubles is to have to sort of hang out in the sulfuric acid while you're, while you're decompressing. So they try to minimize that, but in fact the sulfuric acid layer is too thick for them. They can't quite decompress right below it and then get all the way through it to the fresh water. They minimize their time in it, but they do have to decompress some in that. So here are three divers coming up. In fact, that's Kenny and Nancy and Brian. They're decompressing. Chicken of the Sea is waiting on the uh, dive platform. Uh, but, but again, you can, this, you can sort of see in this more of a close-up how if you, you know, if for a lot of species that fell in there, good luck. Okay, that's all I have to all say. Right. Thanks for being uh, patient and all that, and I will entertain any questions you have. Thanks, yeah.